Several weeks ago we began a new series on, on the fundamentals of the Kabbalah and tonight we'll begin to talk about a topic that's related to the Kabbalah, uh, reincarnation, Yikulein Shamot. It's a very big topic and we're going to have to continue some of it next week. The rabbis tell us in Pirkei Avot, Hayom Katsar Ramelacha Meruba. The day is short, life is short, and there's a lot of work to be done. Why do they remind us this? Because it is very easy for a human being to get caught up in the routine, to be tempted by all that life has to offer, and to forget his true taqlid, his true purpose of why he's here for, what is his mission here. And as the rabbis tell us in Masechet Shabbat, as the rabbis tell us in Masechet Shabbat, Kama yemesh notav shel adam. How long does a person live on the average? The Gemara says 70 years. From the 70 years, subtract 20, because during the first 20 years, he's not punished in Neshamayim. Even though he's mature by 13 and he's responsible for his action, he's not punished until he's 20. So how much are we left? With 50. The Gemara continues on to say, so from the 50 you have to subtract 25. We sleep half the time. So how much do we have left in the 50 years? 25. From the 25 you have to remove 12 and a half for eating, for drinking, for going to the bathroom, right? So how much do we have left? 12 and a half years. How much do we really take advantage of the little bit of, little bit of time that we have left? Time goes by very quickly and there's a lot of work to be done. As I've explained in the past, the world that we live in is the Olam Tikkun. Until now, Tikkun we understood to mean that there's work to be done here, there's something to repair, but with Gilgulei Neshamot, this word Tikkun will receive a different meaning. And that is the Tikkun, the personal Tikkun of every Neshama. Anyway, because life is short, and there's a lot of work to be done, and there's a lot of temptations, the chances are, in this very, in this very short period of time, the chances are that man will not finish everything that he has to do. Not only are the chances great that he will not complete everything, but also it is very possible that he will sin, that he will do damage. Not only will he not fix, not only will he not accomplish, it is also possible that he will cause damage. The damage that we're talking about are the sins, the sins that one does. They cause damage to the neshama, to the soul, and they also do they also cause damage to the olamot halyonim, to the upper worlds. And when the neshama is soiled as a result of its sins, the Kabbalah says that it becomes more and more removed, more distant from its source, from the Almighty. But the Almighty, in all His kindness, has offered us the opportunity to get back to Him, to get closer once again, and that is what the Teshuvah is all about. Teshuvah meaning to return. We become distant from Him, we are able to repair, we are able to cleanse ourselves, we are able to return. That is what Teshuvah is all about. However, what happens if one does not do Teshuvah, if one does not have enough time, or let's say he committed a very, very serious sin, where Teshuvah is not sufficient. For that, HaKadosh Baruch Hu allows Mavit, death. Even though death appears to be something bad because it shortens a person's life, who got to live forever, but that is in some ways very good because it allows for this vessel that is broken to be completely removed and to begin from scratch. After all, the soul is eternal. It is not something that can break apart like the goop, which is prone to disease, sickness, and death. The soul is spiritual. The body falls apart, the body dies, the neshama continues to exist and can come back once again. What is this compared to? The Kabbalah says this is compared to a shatil, a plant, a young plant that you plant in your garden and it didn't catch on. It didn't grow. It didn't do well. What do you do? You uproot it and you plant it in a different corner of your garden. Maybe where there's more sun. Maybe where the soil is better. Maybe it will catch on there. That is the essence of Gilgul. Gilgul means Hashem takes the Neshama, shatters the vessel to death, the Gub, and recreates a new vessel, a new body, a new labush, a new garment, 
it brings the neshama back a second time or perhaps a third time until it repairs itself, until it does what it's supposed to. How many times can this happen? Everybody know? According to the Kabbalah, besides the original time, this can happen three more times. But the Kabbalah also says that that's only if nothing is done during the first three times. If every time the Neshama comes back the Gilgul, it accomplishes something, then it can come back even 15 or 20 times. So there's no contradiction. It all depends on what it's been doing. That is the sod, the secret behind the words in the Torah that we find them from time to time. Mot yubat. Die, he shall die. Why does it have to say die, he shall die? Or he should be killed. Because it happens that a person dies many times. Not just once in this world, but when he comes back again to Gilgul, he will die again. He will be born and he will die again. Now you will understand why in Judaism there is great importance in immediate burial. Because the Kabbalah says that so long as the body is not bur buried, the, nesh the nefesh or the neshama cannot return, cannot come back in a reincarnation. In order for that to happen, the first body has to be eliminated, has to be removed. That is why we are very strict in immediate burial. Imagine if somebody is pregnant in the family already, in that same family, as I will explain later, the neshamot tend to come back in the same family. And the woman is due at any moment soon. This would be a big favor to the neshama if it has to come back to be born immediately. It doesn't mean that everybody who dies is reborn immediately, Gilgul can even happen after several years. When the Neshama wants to come back and it wants to grow, further elevate itself, something it did not do during its lifetime. So there may be some time in between the first Gilgul and the second Gilgul, but we don't know. So we bury the body immediately so as to not to prevent it from getting its tikkun that it needs by coming back in a Gilgul. After all, a Gilgul, a reincarnation, is a tikkun. The body wants it. It's for its benefit. And the sooner, the better. When we're talking about Gilgul, we're mostly talking about the Nefesh. Even though I said uh, a couple weeks ago that there's a Nefesh, a Ruach, a Neshama, a Chayan, a Hida, we're usually talking about the Gilgul of the Nefesh itself. But there are times that they, in the Gilgul, the Ruach comes back, the Neshama comes back. But to simplify things, usually we're talking about the Nefesh coming back and being around in several lifetimes. But perhaps you may have the following question. If the Gilgul is a Tikkun, and the Nefesh comes back, then what are the chances that it's going to do damage again? What if it did several mitzvot in the previous Gilgul, in the previous reincarnation, and now it has to come back? Maybe it will damage that good that it did before. So the Kabbalah says, no, that does not happen for the following reasons. Reason number one, only the part that needs a tikkun comes back. The part that does not need a tikkun stays behind. Then there's another situation, another scenario, where the nefesh in the original Gilgul fixed itself, in other words, in its, in its second Gilgul, because the first time around it didn't accomplish anything, it had to come back to fix itself. And the third time around it is able to bring down its ruach, its spirit. This time around, when the nefesh comes down with the ruach, the ruach cannot come, by, come down by itself. It needs a nefesh. It needs this spirit that is very close to the physical body. That is the gateway from the ruach to the body. There's a nefesh. So this nefesh comes down. It's already repaired. It's coming down this time around only to bring down the ruach. If this individual sins, what will be affected is the ruach, not the nefesh anymore. So however you look at it, that portion which is repaired cannot be damaged again. Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense. Otherwise, it would end up coming back who knows how many times, because every time it may have done some damage. So the damage does not affect the nefesh, or it does not affect those parts of the nefesh that are repaired. We talked several weeks ago about the fact that Akadosh Baruch Hu Mechaven, he basically directs the neshama in this world to meet the people it needs to meet, to do the ma'asim, the deeds that it needs to do, right? It basically gives it direction. It puts it in a place, in a city, in a country, where it needs to be, because the Kadosh Baruch Hu is interested in this neshama doing whatever it is meant to do. This kivun, this direction, 
the circumstances of how this comes about is a package deal. This package deal is called the mazal. Many of you heard the word mazal and think of it as luck, fortune. The real translation of mazal is destiny. The destiny of this neshama is the package. <coughs> what does this package have to do with? It has to do with the previous Gilgul. The, the mazal that a person is born in the direction that it receives, the people that it will meet. All of this has to do with a cheshbon of the previous Gilgul, the previous reincarnation. Now, this is a very, very important statement because the fact that we just explained that Mazal has to do with the previous reincarnation, we'll be able, we will be able to answer many questions. We will be able to understand many difficult areas in Judaism. One of the most difficult areas is Why is it that you see sometimes a religious man, observant, righteous, doing everything properly, but he's suffering? His kids are sick, he's broke, he's struggling. Why? Why does, doesn't he deserve a better life? And on the other end you see a rasha, a wicked man, doing every, anything you can imagine against the Torah, and he's a successful businessman. He just won the lottery. <laughs> Everything is going well. He's healthy. He's over 90. Huh? And he's smoking too. <laughs> and he's not dying. <laughs> What's going on? This is all part of a package deal. And there is a hejbon. We believe in Ashgahat Pratit. We believe in direct supervision. We believe that there is a God who manages the, the world and he's aware of everything so things do not happen randomly so mazal is not exactly randomly mazal, a mazal that a person receives this package but when I say package, some of it is good and some of it is not so good nobody has a perfect package usually this package has to do usually with the previous Gilgul the previous reincarnation and that his tikkun, his personal tikkun will come about through this package through this mazal in other words, he will meet the people he needs to meet, he will hopefully be led to what he needs to do, and be in the place where he needs to be. And that is also one way of understanding why small children die. What did they do? They never committed a sin. Under the age of 13, they're not responsible. So anytime a young child is stricken, something happens to him, or he's born with certain defects, it can only be due to the previous Gilgul. There's no other explanation. Without the Kabbalah, we'd have trouble understanding this. The most we would be able to say is a Komina Shamai. Yeah, but why? Why is it from heaven? Why did heaven decree so? That's the most that we could say. Because we have a Munah. That a Kol Tovah, that everything is for the good. But we would like to have some explanation. Those who survived the Holocaust would love to have some explanation as to why the Holocaust happened. So people want some explanation. The Kabbalah offers quite a few explanations for many of the difficult areas in Judaism that we would not understand if it wouldn't be for the Kabbalah, if it wouldn't be for the Zohar elaborating a little bit about this. So Gilgulei Neshamot, the reincarnation of the soul, is able to explain many of these areas. Before we go on, I want to remind you that uh, you may have read about reincarnation in other religions, especially in Buddhism and in Hinduism some of the Eastern religions. There's a very big difference. First of all, reincarnation does come from Judaism. People are surprised. You know, Judaism believes in reincarnation. Yes, it comes from Judaism. But it's an old concept. Many, many of the nations of the world believe in it because it's real. It's something that they were always aware of. They are, however, much more fatalistic about it. This is what's meant to happen. This is the way it's going to be. There's nothing you can do about it. We know that we are above the mazal. We know that we have free will in some areas. Even though one is stuck in a certain mazal, there are certain things that are up to him. What he does about mitzvot and averot, whether he's a good man or, or he's not a good man, how he conducts himself. There is some degree of free will here. And one can change his mazal too. But the Shuvah, but the Tilam, the kind of we have some flexibility, some leeway. It's not completely fatalistic. We don't have to be resigned to this situation. That's the way it is, and that's it. Even though the Mazal does limit us, because that's part of our Tikkun. 
Nevertheless, there's a great deal, a great part, that is free will, that we will make choices, that we will make decisions. After all, we have to come to our tikkun. That tikkun is not just living a life, it's doing certain things. And those certain things require free will, it requires choices that we will make, not the mazara. Let me share with you a story, a short story that will perhaps explain how Gilgul works. There are many stories, some of them perhaps we'll talk about next week. The following story occurred about 250 years ago, maybe a little more, during the time of the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov was approached by a poor man who was struggling, having a very difficult life. He came to complain and perhaps to ask for some help. Baal Shem Tov, I don't understand. Why do I have to suffer so much? Can you help me? Is there any way out of this? So the Baal Shem Tov says, go to this city and ask to see this individual. He will be able to help you. Okay, so he sets out to this city. He arrives there and he asks one by one, everybody in the city, as soon as he mentions the name of this individual, they spit and they begin to curse. Goes over to the next guy, doesn't want to even hear the name. Cursing, spitting, says, Whoa, wow, what's going on over here? They fi finally somebody tells them which house to go to. He arrives at the house, knocks on the door, and asks to see this individual. The guy starts yelling at him, cursing him. He says, how dare you mention this name? He says, what's wrong? He says, this individual died many years ago, and he was a kamtsan. He was a stingy guy. Didn't share any of his wealth with the community. Not a penny did he give to tzedakah. He was a wicked man. He says, he died many years ago? He says, yes, and we all remember him. In other words, the older citizens. Terrible man. Miserly. Goes back to the Baal Shem Tov and doesn't understand why did he send him to this city. This man is no longer alive. He was a miser. Everybody hates his guts. They're cursing. And the Baal Shem Tov looks at him and says, you were that man. And now you understand why your situation is such. This is your tikkun. That man, of course, took it seriously and began to give a little bit of tzedakah, whatever he could. He was a poor man. But that was his tikkun. People in their mazal also sometimes have certain diseases. Diseases could either be from the previous Gilgul, or it could be because somebody did something in this lifetime. And on Rosh Hashanah, as you know, it is decreed what will happen this year. So, we don't know if it's from the previous Gilgul or from the present situation, but it's very possible that it's from the previous Gilgul. There are different kinds of Gilgulim, for different reasons. There can be a Gilgul because somebody missed out on doing a particular mitzvah. And did I share with you the story of the little child that died after eight days? There was a little boy, about 15, 17, 18 years ago in Israel. And I'm not going to mention whose family it was, because you, you may know who it is. This rabbi, it was this rabbi's son, they brought him to the Brit Milah, they circumcised him, and right after the circumcision, he passed away. And everybody began to cry, it was such a big tragedy. But the father was smiling, he was happy. So somebody went over to him. This is a great rabbi. Why are you smiling? He said, Baruch Hashem, I had the zechut, the merit of bringing down such a pure soul. All it needed was a Brit Milah. It's a tzaddik. It's perfect. It doesn't have to stick around here. Work, get married, have children again. Who needs it? Right? Why do it all over again? All it needed was the Brit Milah. That was its only tikkun. It missed the Brit Milah the last time around. Uh, obviously, this rabbi knew. He had, he had a hakodesh. So he was able to understand. But most of us would not understand what's going on over here. But we, we need to remember that some Gilgulim are precisely for this reason. Because the Neshama is lacking in its svah. There is a Gilgul. Not because of lacking a mitzvah, but because it did some avera, Like the, with the story with the poor man. He didn't give tzedakah, it was miserly. He was miserly, he was... He didn't respect people. So it needs a greater tikkun. What's the difference between coming down here because of a lack of a mitzvah or because of having done an avera? Whoever comes down here just because he's missing a mitzvah or two will not come to sin so easily. The one who's coming here for a tikkun because he did an Averai sin, his challenges will be greater because the Yetzel, the evil instinct, will go after him. 
trying to, to stop him from reaching his tikkun. Then there's a third Gilgul. The Gilgul, a reincarnation of a tzaddik, who does not need to come down, but Hashem brings him down only to be able to help the generation. That Neshama will never sin. Hashem protects him. Because he doesn't need to come down. Hashem therefore does not expose him to all the temptations. Anyway, there are different kinds of Gilgulim, also because there are different Neshamot that come from different Shorashim, from different roots. They all have different jobs, they have different missions. And uh, that is why not everybody is alike. Everybody is given some other job. Because everybody has a neshama from a different shoresh. We spoke briefly about it in the past, that neshamot come from different parts of the main souls. And this is a very big topic in the Kabbalah that we don't have the time to elaborate on. But just like there are sefirot, different sefirot, different attributes of God. There's different souls that come from different attributes, or different, I call them different roots, different branches of this tree of soul. And some are in a different status, some are more elevated than others, and their mission has to do with with, with, with uh, the shortage from where they come from. One of, there's one mitzvah in the Torah, of all 613 mitzvot, that clearly is connected or related to Gilgul. If you ever wonder why the Torah is commanding such a commandment, it's only because of Gilgul. Anybody know which commandment that is? Yibum. If a woman who was married becomes a widow, in other words, her husband dies, and they had no children together, there is a mitzvah on the brother-in-law to be meyaben this woman, to marry this woman. He can otherwise not marry his brother's wife. But through Yibu, not only can he, there is a mitzvah that they marry in order that there should be a child born and that the name of the deceased should not be erased. What does all that mean? So the Zohar says, very simple, anybody who does not have children, either because he didn't want to get married or because he got married and somehow did not have children, he's automatically reincarnated. He's missing a, a big part of his tikkun, which is to leave behind a child in this world continuation. And since he did not, it says a mitzvah on the brother to marry this woman, his sister-in-law, so that his brother, the deceased, should come back in a Gilgul. In the, the one who who died will come back in this woman. In the previous lifetime, this woman was his wife. In this lifetime, she will be his mother. But it's the same individual. That's the way it works. So here we have an example of a Gilgul to do what? To be metaken, that which he could not have done in the previous lifetime. And that is what? To have children. He's missing a mitzvah, he's missing a continuation. And as well says that that's an automatic Gilgul. And the rabbis tell us in the Kabbalah that usually the Gilgulim are therefore in the same family. Because it's in the same root, they usually tend to come back in the same family, even if it's, if it's after several generations. It could be a great, great uncle that will come back as your child because you are from the same root, from the same Shoresh HaNeshama. Now we will understand another topic. And that is the topic of Zivugim, soulmates. Even though I've spoken about soulmates in the past, we'll talk a little bit more about the, the soul right now. What is a true soulmate? According to the Kabbalah, the Neshama, before it comes down to this world, consists of Zafar Venekeva, a male and female counterpart. The male usually comes down first, the female follows, and that is why usually the husband is older than the wife by a number of years. The husband can be a year older, could be five years older, could be ten years older, or more. My father-in-law, Allah Shalom, was 22 years older than my mother-in-law. What, what happened there? This is an aside. I wasn't planning on mentioning this, but this is an aside. What could have happened? He, he could have been his, her father. He's a Holocaust survivor. And because he's a Holocaust survivor, it's possible, this is my own personal theory, that his real Zivug died in the Holocaust. Not everybody made it. So they gave him a new Zivug, a new soulmate, which needs to be from the same root, of course, in order for them to succeed. So, you could be many years older, but for some reason, when the time comes, Hashem puts the two together. So, 
Originally, when the souls come down, they split. The male comes down first, the female follows. But that's the original time. Later on, when the male is reincarnated, he does not always get his original soulmate from a previous lifetime. And I'll explain why not next week. It has to do with the reincarnation of women. Who does he get? He still gets his soulmate, but it's not the one from the previous lifetime. It's just one from the same Shoresh HaNeshama. She has to be from the same root, otherwise it will not be successful. Why does it have to be from the same Shoresh? Because a woman does the following for the man. In other words, the, the, the woman he marries. She compliments him physically, she helps him emotionally, mentally, and as the rabbis tell us, she's also a choma, keneged na yetzerara. She is a wall of protection against the evil inclination. On top of that, she is also, together with him, able to bring children into the world. In order for all of this to be successful, that she should be an Ezer Kenegdo, physically, emotionally, mentally, to be a good wall, a good protection to her husband, and that they should have children. When the two complement each other in all these ways, then you know that this is, these two individuals are probably from the same Shodesh and Shama, from the same root. There's no reason why they will not be able to get along and have a successful relationship. Now comes the big question. How many soulmates can one have? Seven. For men. For men? That's maybe in Tunisia only. You know? In Morocco, in Tunisia, that's right. What is that? One of the book is several That's interesting. Uh, one at a time. <laughs> well, let, let, let me make it easy for you. Remember the days where it was permissible for men to marry more than one woman? If you still want it, you can still do it. You know, in, in Teman, they allow it. But in this country, they won't. Well, a man was allowed to marry more than one. Yaakov, who was his Zivud? Rachel, Leah, Bilha, Zilpa, he had four women. Anyway, if it's the first time around, and most of us have been here many, many times, but if it's the first time around, one has one zivug, his other half. Very simple. And what are the other ones? Nashim hameyu adotlo. Women that have been designated for him because they are from the same Shodesh and Neshama. Like David Amelech, he also had several women. And there were some that were designated, that were meyu adotlo. So they are like they're his batuk, but they're, they're not necessarily the original batuk. So it is possible for one to have more than one. However, the other ones are not the batuk. When is it possible that one will have more than one batuk in a lifetime? A real batuk? A real batuk? If the second woman is coming to be mashlin his ruach or his neshama. We've been speaking about nefesh right now. The nefesh needs a tikkun. Once the nefesh has reached a certain tikkun, or even if it already has reached a tikkun from a previous lifetime, but now it comes down with the ruach or with the neshama, he could have a bazug that will help him with his nefesh, he could have a bazug that will help him with his ruach. On condition, the only way it will work, and the only way it's a bazug, is if it's from the same shoresh and neshama. Now comes the tricky question, how do you know somebody is from the same Shodesh and Neshama, from the same root? Basically three ways. If somebody is from the same root, it will be an easy relationship, number one. Number two, they will have children together. According to the Kabbalah, if a couple does not have children, there's a chance that this is not his true Badu. So they may have children together. And number three, number three, they complement each other. Wherever one is lacking, the other one fills in. Because nobody is perfect, right? So we're work, if one has a particular problem, a chitaron, and the other one can help that individual with that weakness, and the other way around too, the other side helps that other individual, then you know that they're probably from the same shortage and they were meant for each other. Yes. Great question, yeah. Very good question, yeah. How come there's so many divorces and how come if they were meant, not meant to be together, why did they meet each other? Yeah, okay, very good question. A lot of people today, unfortunately, have lost their true batum. They have unnecessarily delayed it. 
and she's not going to wait around. He wants to get a college degree. He wants to become a lawyer and spend eight years in school. If he's, if he's, if he's Bazouk, he's a few years younger, she's not going to wait. He has to be, the man has to be a good man, a tzaddik, behaving himself for Hashem to tell her, you know what, you wait. And what's going to happen when she waits? She's going to continue to go out, but Hashem is going to put it in her mind, this is not for me, this is not for me. He's too tall, he's too short. And she's not picky, it's only Hashemayim. Hashem is reserving her for this individual who's a tzaddik, who's a good man, but for some reason he's taking his time. But it's very risky. If you're taking your time not for not for a good reason, you run the risk of losing. So a lot of men are marrying women who are not their badzug. A lot of men, because of their ma'asim, because of their behavior, are marrying nisha lefi ma'asad. A woman lefi ma'asad is a woman according to your level. It could be that the real badzug is on a higher level. And this guy is not behaving himself. Why should he spoil this good girl? So Hashem therefore gives him a woman who is on his level, and she's not the best match. That's number two. Number three, people are very picky today. They're looking for money. They're looking for beauty. Or they're looking to get a green card. Right? <laughs> so they just, you know, get married. Another reason, people are living together before they get married. And when you live together, you are ruining the relationship. You cannot be intimately involved before the Nesuin, before the Holy Union called Nesuin. Because the ultimate union is the Nesuin, the ring, the being together, the Kusha. And if you do that too early, it can spoil the whole relationship. So there are many factors uh, of what, that, that explain why people are not getting along and why people are, are divorcing. The simple explanation of why people are divorcing is not because they met the wrong person. People today are very selfish too, much more than 50 years ago. They're less tolerant. They're not working on their problems. They're treating marriage as paper plate. This doesn't work out. I'll just take someone else. So there's, there's many explanations for why people are not meeting their real basher, their real soulmates, plus why even the ones who are meeting are ended up ending up in getting divorced. Because this is, this is a good relationship. This is a good match. But one or the two of them are selfish. Or he's an alcoholic then this could be great. If you wouldn't be an alcoholic, it would work out. You have gamblers out there. You have to blame Las Vegas for this. Yeah? Or all these or casinos. If there wouldn't be these temptations, maybe this marriage would survive. So you have selfishness, you have temptations. We live in a world where it's in style to get divorced, where it's in style to live together, where it's in style not to get married. So that, you know, people assimilate the values of the Gentile world. And then, of course, what I said before, they're not necessarily meeting up with the true Zibud because they didn't deserve it. They didn't conduct themselves properly or they pushed it off unnecessarily. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's true. That's a good point. If you already had children in the past, you believe this may not be a problem in coming to good. That's true. But we don't know how Hashem works and if this will always make a difference or not. It is just stated so in the, in the Zohar that if there's no children, there's a, uh, an immediate good. Maybe this is talking about the very first time around. Obviously, it makes more sense that way. Because it all depends what he needs to repair. If all he's here is for something very specific, if he had no children for some reason, that could be part of his mazal, right? Then he may not have to come back for that. It could be all he needs to do is, is uh, do a, perform a certain mitzvah. He's done with that, he leaves this world. And that's it. According to the Kabbalah, I mentioned that that thing was the last week or two weeks ago. Uh, ever since the destruction of the Second Temple, there are very few Neshamot Hadashot. There are very few new souls that are here for the first time. The people have been, there, have been here several several times. I'll speak a little bit more about it at the end. Anyway, so because the Zivu, the true Zivu, between husband and wife is from the same Shodesh and Neshama, they have a spiritual connection, as we explained last week. The two of them can actually sense it when they're dating, 
or after they get to know each other, that there's something there. People call it a click, people call it this chemistry. Hashem somehow puts it into their mind to be able to identify it. Because it's from the same Shodesh and Hashem. With this idea in mind, we will understand something interesting. The story with Yaakov and Rachel. It says that Yaakov was willing to work seven years for Rachel. And it says at the time, the seven years that he took upon himself to work went by very quickly because of his love for her. Well, that's strange. Whenever you want something, it seems forever. And here it says the time went by very quickly because of his love for her. Anybody want to suggest? How could it be that it went by so quickly? Every day should have been, oh, another day, another year, another month. When will I, when will I be able to marry her? What? There's different explanations. Some say that this guy was seven years old. Some say she was 14. So he was waiting seven years for her to be able to be, become pregnant. So he knew that the time has not arrived. That's one of the explanations given. But the simple, the simple explanation is we're dealing here with something spiritual. Since he knew that this is this Batu, he felt it immediately. He knew right away he had no doubt whatsoever. He felt a spiritual connection. He was able to focus on his work in Adam Haram. Had this been not spiritual, had this been pure physical, he's physically attracted to her, he wants her, this is pure passion, then he, every single moment and every single day, that's all he would think about. And if that's all he would think about, time would be, you know, eternal. Because it's a spiritual connection, he doesn't have to focus on that. He's able to focus on his work. He focused on his work. Time went by very quickly. No problem. You follow me? Because he knew that this was his soulmate. And therefore, he didn't have to focus on the physical. Right. Yeah, nobody really, I didn't see anybody explain why the number seven, except for the one who said that it had to do with her age. Oh, well, well, you, you don't have too many father-in-laws like Lavan. <laughs> But Leah was also meant for him. Oh. Maybe I didn't explain it. Oh. I asked before how many, uh, how many Badoo can you have? Even though Rachel was his real one, Leah was also meant for him. Oh. And so was his time, was so, and so was his time. Especially after she prayed that she didn't want to fall into the hands of the son. Only one that is shown at that time. It's not necessarily today. In the very beginning, when the Neshama comes down here for the first time, then there's only one true, other half. But because there are many souls who belong to the same Shoresh and Neshama, one man can have more than one wife. More, more than one woman can be meyuedet law, can be designated for him. It's very possible. Okay, so we've spoken about the, we've spoken about the typical type of reincarnation. The next type of reincarnation is called an Ibur. Ibur is a pregnancy. And the Shema is impregnated into a living being. You have Reuven, Shimon, Levi, who's alive with his own Nefesh, with his own Shema. And he is able to receive while he's alive. Not as a baby. A real good good, you are born with it, right? You're born with the Shema. Ibur means you're alive and you receive. You are impregnated with another Shema of, of, of another individual. Ibu usually occurs with the neshama or nefesh or rock of a tzaddik. The rabbis tell us the following thing. Habali taher Whoever wants to become pure, he wants to elevate himself, they will help him. He will receive divine assistance. So according to the Kabbalah, the sod, the secret of these things, is what kind of divine assistance? The ibur. That there will be a neshama shetit aberbo, in the Neshama of a Tzaddik that will impregnate the seven him, that will be his mentor, his guide. It will help him. What, which Neshama will it be? Depending on what Mitzvah this individual is about to perform. Depending on which Mitzvah it is, they will send a Neshama that excels in that Mitzvah to be in the body of this individual who is about to perform this Mitzvah. The Neshama Hamit Aberet, the Neshama that is, is being impregnated, cannot sin. It can only gain from the favor that is doing to this neshama down here. So the neshama up there has another chance to get some more credit, 
Plus, the neshama down here is able to further itself by receiving help from above. That is one form of ibur. There are various kinds of ibur. We don't have time to go into all the types of ibur, but I'll tell you one more type of ibur. Imagine a nefesh that was working during its lifetime to repair itself. That is the reason why it came down in Gilgul, in a reincarnation. It can no longer be zokheh to receive its ruah for its neshama, because it's repairing itself. We spoke about that two weeks ago. When a nefesh is repairing itself, it cannot receive its ruah and its neshama, that it would have received the first time around. But since it repairs itself, it can receive a neshama be'ibur. And that neshama that it receives be'ibur acts as its ruah, or, or as its neshama. So there are several reasons why an ibur will occur. This fascinating area of ibur, the fascinating area of how it works, is able to explain why, or how I should say, all of Am Yisrael can fulfill all the 630 commandments. How is it possible for all of us to fulfill all the 13? By the way, when we talk about fulfilling all the 13, we're talking about the ones that are applicable today. There's no Beth HaMikdash, so some of them are not relevant. But even for the ones that are applicable, not everybody has a pidyon bechor. Because you didn't have, either you're a Kohen or a Levi, or your first child was a cesarean birth, so there's no pidyon. How are you able to fulfill all the 613 mitzvot? In a lifetime, for sure not. How does it happen then? Either through Gilgulim, you eventually do fulfill all the mitzvot to the very many Gilgulim, or through Ibun. That the, the, the neshama of the tzaddik needs a particular mitzvah that it is not fulfilled. But it doesn't have to come back to Gilgul. Piggyback, exactly. It comes impregnated in another soul, temporarily, and it leaves whenever it needs to. One who receives the neshama the Ibu can lose that neshama if he gets angry. Kaas, anger is a, is a terrible midah. Not only does it do harm to the neshama, if there was a neshama of a tzaddik impregnated temporarily, it will just leave. It does not stick around. Many of you have heard of another type of impregnation, a negative one, called the book. And there are many stories of possession, as they're called in English. And that is not a neshama or a ruach, it's a nefesh of a rasha, of a wicked man who has no peace. He's so wicked, they don't let him into purgatory, into Gehenom. He's in the Kafakela, a place called the slingshot. In other words, he has no rest. And we'll talk about that more next week, what it feels like to be in the Kafakela. But a dibuk is an individual who's running around, being chased by demons, has no peace, but occasionally they allow him to enter or possess a living body of someone, where it rests temporarily. In the meantime, this individual who's possessed goes crazy. And people sometimes are not, are not able to identify. Is he schizophrenic? Is he ill? What does he have? Unless they hear a voice, another voice coming out in the stomach, which is usually one way of identifying that there's another spirit in there. This kind of a, of a but impregnation is a negative one because it's not for the benefit of the individual. It just gives the soul, the spirit that has no rest, a little bit of rest. Why this individual is being possessed? Obviously, he must have done something wrong to get to get himself into trouble. There's another kind of ibur that happens rarely, but it can happen, is that two individuals are alive. One is a big tzaddik, and the other one is a good person. And the neshama, or portion of the neshama of the tzaddik, can impregnate itself while the two are alive. And according to the Kabbalah, that is the sod of the pasuk that describes the relationship between David and Yonatan. That the nefesh of Yonatan means the bat ben shel David. Other than the, the literal meaning that they were very close friends, the meaning according to the Kabbalah is that there is a certain impregnation while, while, while one is alive from another individual who is also alive. It also could happen that a person nefesh will leave him while he's alive, a part of him, and it will be switched with another message. That can also happen sometimes, and that explains why sometimes people change dramatically. They've gone berserk. Something has happened to them. And it could be that their message has been switched. But this is a very esoteric topic, and I'm not going to get into that. But it, do, it can happen that a portion of a person's message leaves. It's just like when you're asleep, we know a portion leaves and goes up, and depending on the level of the soul, it can see and dream of all sorts of things. It can also happen that while one is alive and awake, a portion of his, ne of his message leaves him. And there's just enough there left to keep him alive.
but it is replaced with another nefesh. Then there is something called the Shammai Yitera, that we receive on Shabbat. What is the purpose of a Neshama Yitera, which is an extra soul? In order for us to truly experience the Kedusha, the sanctity of the Shabbat, in order for us to truly experience what Hashem wants us to experience, Hashem helps us by making not only this day special, not only by abstaining from work, not only by making the Kiddush, but by giving us a Neshama Yitera, this extra soul, or an extra level, that actually allows us to experience something which we do not experience the rest of the week. Even the learning is different. Anybody that learns the whole week and learns the Shabbat can notice it's different. The food is different. Everything is different. Your whole demeanor should be different. And that's why it's not such a good idea to go to sleep for the whole Shabbat. You lose that, you don't feel anything if you're asleep. Even though part of the Shabbat, of the Minofa, is to sleep, it's a great feeling, a great experience for those who have tried it. Well, I say for those who have tried it because there are those who hesitate. Shabbat, they think, is difficult. So it's the most beautiful experience after you've tried it, you've seen it, you will see a tremendous change, a, a beautiful feeling. Okay, we've come to the last point. A, uh, an individual is here in a reincarnated soul who usually not, does, does not know why he's here for. Why is that? Wouldn't it, be better, wouldn't it be better for him to know what his mission is? By this he can focus on the mission, not get lost, and finish everything. Part of the reason why the Neshama does not know clearly even though it is guided to what it needs to do, is in order to allow for free will. In order for free will to really exist, it can't, you can't know everything. It's not always a good idea to know the future. It's not always a good idea to know everything. Because then you will only focus on that. And you are limiting yourself. The Neshama has a great opportunity this time around to grow. And if it would only focus in one area of its tikkun, not only is it narrowing its opportunities, its growth, not only is it limiting itself, it also runs the risk of living this world a little bit early. You finish your tikkun, okay, you have nothing else to do here. That does not always happen, obviously. There's more, more reason for this individual to stay. Even though he's finished his tikkun, Hashem may want him to stick around a little bit longer for some other reason. Nevertheless, Hashem did not want it to make it too clear, too obvious, because everybody would focus just on that. What would happen to all the other mitzvot? To everything else? So in order not to limit our opportunities for growth, we're not always aware of precisely what it is we need to know. We have an idea, we have a feeling, because we are led in that direction. We will be led to do what we need to do as long as we allow ourselves to do it. In the past uh, 100, 200, 300 years, most uh, souls have only been endowed with the nefesh. And the Kabbalah says because of that, the Avodah, avodah Hashem has become more and more difficult. Whereas in previous generations you have tremendous great tzaddikim, it is because they had other parts of their nefesh too. Since we only have, most of us only have a nefesh, it has become more, much more difficult, much more of a challenge. Especially right before Mashiach comes, when the rabbis tell us that there will be no more gilgulim, there will be no more time for gilgulim. So the nefesh, this is almost the last opportunity for the nefesh to, to fix itself. So the yetzer is going to work much more harder to prevent the nefesh from reaching its tikkun. What does Hashem do then? Hashem wants everybody to be repaired. And there's no more time for Gilgulim. Hashem is coming. So He sends settled. Hashem has sent many, many tragedies, many wars, a holocaust. So what the Kabbalah explains is that all of these tragedies, what they all have in common, is a kaparat avonot. It's an atonement for sins. It's a fast tikkun. There's no more time to bring you back in a Gilgul. So it comes about in the form of a tara, in the form of a tragedy, to quickly make, bring about the tikkun. Nevertheless, even though it's, it's difficult today, I'm sure all of you have noticed that there's a tremendous tikkun a tremendous awakening of tshuva everywhere in the world. And the reason why that is happening is because Rahmei Shamayim, a who has compassion over his people, we are his children, and he will give us a push. And that push is mentioned in the Nabi Malachi, the last prophet. I will send you a Eliyahu Nabi right before Mashiach comes. You will see children bringing back their parents to Shuba. This is an incredible phenomenon. He did not have this years ago, generations before. So, not only is the Kadosh Baruch Hu bringing about his past the Tikkun, he's also giving us a push. He's sending Eliyahu Nabi to awaken everybody because Mashiach is coming and it's going to be too late. I think what the rabbis have said
said about the Shuvah is very true today. The rabbi say, and I can look for who said, "Bitchuli peta shel matat, v'ani etzach lachem kibitpo shel olam." You just open me, open me, an opening the size of a needle head, and I will open you an entrance, a very, very large entrance of a hallway, of a hall. Hashem says, "You just take the initial step. Take a small step. If you take a small step." I assure you that I will help you with the rest. I think this is very much happening in our generation. The people are taking small steps, but they're getting there. Not that much work is left to do. Hashem is giving us the push. Hashem is showing us the way. All we need to do is take a small step. And last but not least, people might have the impression that a Gilgul is no good. Coming back, coming back, coming back. If you know Gilgul is very good, especially compared to what you will hear next week, something called the Enon, Kapakela, Gilgul is something very good. Gilgul is not only a tikkun, it's also an opportunity to progress, to achieve, to gain more mitzvot. Especially if you happen to be in a Gilgul during the time of Mashiach, like all of us is Hashem. That we will also be zokhe, we will have the merit of seeing the Mashiach very soon. Amen. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. If, you're, if, if you have a very sensitive soul, if you're in tune with, with everything you do, obviously you will have a better idea of what your mission was. So most people are not paying attention, right? They're so busy with their investments, with their retirements, with their pensions, with their jobs, with their, with their bills. They don't think about their mission in life. Obviously, if you pay attention, and we'll talk about that two weeks from now, we'll talk about meditation two or three weeks from now, you can... You can have a much better idea of what you need to accomplish in this life.